Hi, 3DMJers. This is Andrea Valdez, and you are listening to the 3D Muscle Journey podcast. This is our first powerlifting episode. I'm joined by Brad Loomis and Eric Helms, and we discuss how we work with our powerlifters, how that is different sometimes than how we work with our bodybuilders, and how we work with our dual athletes. So we have quite a bit of individuals on our roster who actually compete in both of these sports. And so how do we navigate in and out of those seasons? How is cutting weight different for a power lifter versus a bodybuilder? And everything in between. I would really encourage you guys to stick around on if you're any type of muscle and strength athlete. There are quite a few nuggets in this that apply to both sports. So I hope you guys enjoy this conversation with Brad Loomis and Eric Helms on powerlifting, bodybuilding, and the dual athlete. Okay, so mm. this is the first time mm-hmm, on the uh, mm. 3DMJ podcast that we're going to talk about, uh, I don't even say not bodybuilding, but we're going to introduce powerlifting. Uh, specifically, in this episode, we're going to talk about, um, I don't want to say the objective differences because we know they're different sports, but we deal with a lot of dual athletes. Um, and I know that you guys both have rosters of exclusively powerlifters, exclusively bodybuilders, and some dual athletes, correct? Correct. Yep, okay. definitely. And I don't, uh, so I'm actually really interested in all of this. I have a lot of physique athletes, and them, well, and some of them have powerlifting ambitions as well, and so we're doing that, but I don't have any just powerlifters. So um, if y'all don't mind me picking your brains for like an hour or two, is that cool? I'm so yeah. comfortable. Okay. What if I? What if y'all said no? What would I do? I don't even know what I would do. I'll just hang out. We wouldn't have a we wouldn't have a podcast this week. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it would be a podcast of just sitting us doing this. <laughs> <laughs> what's uh, what's the ratio of powerlifters to bodybuilders on y'all's rosters? Um, I may not be a good good representation because I haven't taken on a new bunch of new clients in a while. I haven't taken on new clients in a couple of years, so maybe yeah. Brad could answer that to give you a better idea of what our split is for company wide. Yeah, I I think on my roster right now it's probably 60-40, 60% physique, 40% powerlifters. And I would say of those 40% that are powerlifters, some of them have either or are doing both. So like some of my powerlifters, they've done their powerlifting competitions and now we're focusing on physique, um, bodybuilding, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I, I think that's kind of what my split is right now. That's so. Is that like is that like thirty percent pure pure powerlifters who wouldn't be ever competing in physique stuff? Maybe. Um. Yeah, I think that's probably a pretty fair guess. Yeah. That sounds about right. That's crazy because five years ago it was zero percent, right? Yeah, uh, pretty much. Yeah, for me anyway. Yeah, yeah I yeah. I um. A few more. Yeah, I I had a few for I, well yeah I had a few um. I think, yeah, Berto and I had had a couple. I think we were that we were the we had more time in in powerlifting coaching. So I started coaching Bryce in like early 2010. Um, but Bryce was uh, a with you as a bodybuilder. No, actually, well, he 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 said he wanted to get back on stage, but then he he just never ended up doing it. You know, I think he competed last show was 2009. And so. then he turned out. Oops. Um, genetically oh, incredibly gifted look at that. exactly yeah <laughs> oops yeah, i'm elite <laughs> yeah exactly in two weight classes above me right yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> so um i guess is there a difference in the way that you would set up the coaching system like do you um we talked about a couple podcasts ago i think number two podcast number two uh with the art of coaching, we talked about what we expect from our athletes, be that their their spreadsheet, their video check-in, um, so which includes body weight, includes their macros that they're eating, and a weekly summary, right? Is there anything that you request differently from a power lifter? Yes. Uh, we both said sure. yes. Go ahead, Brett. Um. For the most part, the basic structure of it is still the same. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, they have a day that they check in on. Um, you know, their spreadsheet is all updated for me to view. Um, those that would like to do vlogs, I invite that, and and you know, I'm very open about that. Mm-hmm. Um, so the basic structure is still the same. Right. Um, 
However, the, the, the big kind of differences between the two is that obviously with, with power lifters, we're not focusing um, so much on how the physique is looking. Okay. So I don't necessarily need to see physique photos unless they're a dual athlete. With them, I kind of want to see their lifts, uh, especially if it's kind of around the period of time where maybe we're testing or we're tweaking something. They're going to submit videos of their lifts, whereas the bodybuilder, you know, is not uh, necessarily going to do that. Um, and then, I mean, really outside of that, I mean, we're not really, really focusing on weight loss, you know, per se. And so we're not, you know, tweaking macros and looking at, you know, net calories and all that kind of good stuff to making sure we're maintaining the deficit to maintain weight loss for most power lifters. I mean, unless they really have aggressive goals particular weight class that's below their current weight um that's going to be kind of like you know just status quo status quo status quo keep doing keep doing keep doing and then we're going to kind of focus more on the training aspect of it okay and you eric yeah pretty pretty similar um if i've got a powerlifter who is cutting a weight class it looks a lot more similar but I, i still don't get pictures like i um i think like it's, it's, does it, I mean, yeah, you, you'd think you want to make sure you're losing fat and not muscle, but you really care about the result of what happens when you're maintaining muscle. So if performance is doing what you want, like I typically look at like Wilk score uh, over time and then obviously kind of absolute performance as well and then rate of weight loss. Um, if they're cutting, they're, they're, they're tracking nutrition in a similar way to a bodybuilder, but probably still not quite as strict. Um, but then if you've got a, a powerlifter who's just maintaining their weight class or uh, then it's much more training for- focused. I typically ask them to get me a video of their every week a video of their heaviest set on uh, on the big three, and then they have the option of sending in any accessory movements they want if they want to audit their form kind of thing. Uh, and then it's all training stuff and uh, you know just talking about how they're feeling about things. Okay. Um, Trying to think anything else that I do unique to powerlifters. Well, Not really. I was yeah. going to ask, um, obviously with a bodybuilder in contest prep, week to week is important. It can, um, I mean, I know if it ain't broke, we don't fix it, but it's possible that we're changing something every week for like three or four weeks in a row. With a power lifter, you, do you feel the need to coach them week to week all the time, only when they're tapering for a meet? Um, does it depend on the person? I think this is where probably Eric and I are going to be be different okay eric because with me i'm much more numbers driven and i i really like to see you know numbers whereas eric it seems like at least in my opinion because eric's been uh coaching me on powerlifting he doesn't seem to need the numbers like, like i do you know it, 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 eric's kind of like able to intuitively be able to tell things just by you know my lifts etc cetera, etc cetera. um so i don't feel as confident in my ability just sending somebody okay here's you know, eight weeks of programming, um, go at it. You know what I mean? So for me, I like weekly check-ins simply because I've got a, you know, my spreadsheet is set up just such that they're reporting to me what their, their, uh, last set felt like through an RPE. And then depending on the block of training, say that we're doing a volume mesocycle where I want to increase volume, I can kind of look at my spreadsheet and say, okay, you know what we, we went up 30% on squat uh, their last set RPE on, you know, all of their exercises was eight and a half. I feel pretty comfortable driving volume up another, you know, 30, 40 percent. So I do like to have weekly check-ins, especially for my more novice slash beginner type power lifters. Okay. I probably would feel more comfortable with a um, very, you know, seasoned kind of a veteran sending them, okay, here's your volume cycle. Go to it. Ask questions when you might. But I think really, to be honest with you, that's just because I'm, I'm probably not quite as experienced as Eric in coaching uh, power, power lifters. And I kind of need that weekly check-in. Let me adjust your spreadsheet. Let me look at the numbers. Let me get the volume increases that I want, et cetera. Whereas I think Eric's, Eric's able to do that a little bit more by his gut. Yeah, I, Eric, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I, I would say that I – it's not that I like, for, so if we're talking about like looking at volume load and changing it over time, I tend to, because I program in such a similar way all the time, not mm-hmm. that it's like cookie cutter, but like the principles I use for, for programming, yeah. I, 
I know what the, the rough volume is for a block of training. And I, I know how to, without actually creating like a volume load, like a calculator, I get, I get a rough idea of where someone's volume is if I want to progress it or I don't. And then typically what I'm doing on their spreadsheet is I'm looking at their relative increase in strength. Um, and then, you know, seeing, okay, did they improve? Did they improve? Uh, whether I'm doing, you know, AMRAPs and deriving a 1RM or whether that's a, a, like a, you know, a mock meet or an actual meet and thinking, what, what do I think is reasonable for this person? But, um, but you know, the, the thing is, is, is like Brad with a novice, I do like to uh, get more regular check-ins. And I think more so just because the, the, the lifter themselves needs that because they, they don't really know that you're going to have good weeks and bad weeks and that, some days it's going to feel easy and it's supposed to feel that way. And I want to check to make sure they're not doing quote unquote extra credit and things like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but Brad is probably one of the most coachable people I've ever worked with. So, I mean, I'm very comfortable giving you an eight week block. You've been training for, I was thinking that know. like when you say yeah. Eric just kind of lets me go, I'm like, well, is it because he does it with everyone or just cause he does it with you, Brad, because obviously he trusts you and talks to you all the time and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the thing is I, we, we end up, we have a coach, a coaching meeting every week and you know, Brad's on my, the, the private message on Slack, so anytime he needs to get to me, I know he will. Yeah, and I um, guess we should mention that too to anyone who's listening. Um, obviously, well, all three of us have competed in powerlifting and been on the bodybuilding stage, but currently at the moment, uh, Eric is coaching Brad as of, what, three months ago, four months ago? When did that start? I can't remember now. Was it January? Actually, it's been a little while now. December? I started yeah, so I, year. Yeah, I, start, I think I, I did your programming up to nationals, right? Or no? No, not nationals. Um, right after nationals. I think it was right after nationals, I want to yeah. say. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Time flies. Yeah. Now I, I remember I was like... back in Corpus. Dang, that was a long time ago. So it was end of last year when we started? So yeah. six months? I, I believe so. Yeah, I want to say about then. Uh, yeah. Why did that happen? What had you been doing prior to, Brad? Um, well, but prior to that, I had a, a client of mine, one of our Australian clients that uh, just came to me out of the blue and said, you know, I, I would, I would like to, you know, do your programming, you know, would you be interested? And I said, yeah, shoot, you know, no, I'd be, I'd be happy to do that. And I actually learned a lot from that, that coach client relationship. And then, you know, basically nothing bad ever happened. We just kind of parted ways and just kind of grew apart a little bit and, I really found out how coachable I was and how much I did enjoy coaching, really, to be honest with you. And it was kind of a, almost a hole in my life. It's like, I need, I don't need a lot. I don't need someone to sit there and tell me every single day, do this, do this, do this, you know, et cetera. But man, just a little bit of guidance, just a little bit of, of, of some, some, you know, do this over, you know, the course of 10, 12 weeks. That's all I need is just a little bit of guidance and I'll just run with it. And so, yeah, I think it was about that time that I realized I was missing that, that, that hole in my life, that, that coach or that coach client relationship. Um, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but I remember I was like, it was after nationals and I was like, you know, maybe, maybe the folks at my, at my, my gym that I train at here in Reno would be, That's right. you know, in, interested in, in kind of doing my programming and plus they're there so they can watch my form and, Eric was like, are you sure you want to do that? You know, <laughs> like, I was like, you know, I, I know like, a guy. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, yeah, and, and that was like, oh, well, shoot. Yes. You know, because I mean, I, I was kind of reluctant because Eric was right in the thick of collecting all of his his data for his, you know, his, his final push. And I was I didn't want to just come right out and say, please. <laughs> but as soon as the door opened, I would I just I stepped right in, you know, so. Um, do you, what is also the, I guess the ratio, Eric, cause I think how many, um, experienced seasoned power lifters, um, what am I trying to ask? Is that, a, are they, do they tend to be more coachable or less coachable than a new person getting into powerlifting? I will, there's always individual differences, but, but typically yeah. if someone gets more experienced, um, they become more coachable if you tr change your uh, coaching approach. If you try to coach them like a novice and try to be very micromanagey, uh, you, you typically end up doing worse in, in some departments than they could uh, because they, like I think Jeff talked about this in the uh, Art of Coaching, um, how he really puts some of the training elements in the hands of, of his more experienced um, 
athletes because they have so much you know time working with their own body and they they, they can realize things and auto regulate in an effective way i th- i think it's the job of the coach is just to provide the the structure for auto regulation you know so that you can allow a experienced lifter to to capitalize on that so f- for example one thing i'll do <clears throat> with an experienced powerlifter that i won't do with a novice um is I'll give them like an RPE range or a, 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 an RPE figure and a percentage 1RM so they know where it should fall. Um, if I do that with some uh, either less secure or more overzealous mindset or novices, they either will just ignore it because they don't know how to use it, um, which is probably the better decision out of these two, or they'll be constantly adjusting their load and then getting it wrong um, kind of thing. But um, But some people just have very stable performance as well, like – and you just don't need to need to use RP that much. It's pretty individual. But um, I think the take home, but the difference between a novice and an advanced powerlifter is that uh, they typically they always tend to be good students of the sport. It's tough to run into, especially someone who seeks us out for coaching. Um, it's tough to run into somebody who is a high level powerlifter who's seeking out three DMJ who doesn't understand some of the relationships between. You know, volume, load, intensity, and what matters. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, Brad would be like at the top of that list as an actual coach. So I, I know when I give him, you know, a, a, a block of training, and he is going to fit it in over the week, even if he changes the schedule. I know he's not going to do something weird like, all right, I'm just going to go hypertrophy and strength back to back days, and I don't know why my strength was jacked up. You know, like I know he'll have a rest day between there, put mm-hmm. the power day there, whatever, and he'll match it to a schedule, and it will be you know, in, in, in the most effective way that matches his life. But if I do that with a novice, like I've had, you know, guys do their, their power work as like a, a back off after their strength. And I'm just like, what are you doing? And they're like, I don't know. Like, I'm like, what? so I've, I've learned sometimes that, um, you kind of have to, or they get really, really hung up on things cause they, they have you know, mis- misconceptions. Like if I give them you know, singles, doubles, and triples at 70 to 80% of 1RM, they think it's supposed to be like dynamic effort work, like old school West Side or something like that. You have to, they need to be taught the principles which, they're, which their program is based on so they do it in an effective way when left to their own devices. Or you need to take a more hands-on approach. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Brad, have you, if we're talking novice lifters, is it really difficult to, like, do you ever have to, literally teach them the lifts or do they always kind of I already squat bench and dead and now I want to be a competitor or someone been like I want to be a powerlifter but I've never stood under a barbell like does that Mm -hmm, happen mm -hmm. it once once and and really to be honest with you um it wasn't even like the 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 person uh came to us and and applied for coaching and you know etc 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 it was a very special case in fact I've kind of been documenting it on my my vlog where I had a, an athlete that's uh, uh, in high school, and he wanted to do powerlifting for his senior project. Um, so he's a very young kid, and you know he he's lifted because he's an athlete and he's a football player, but he did not uh, um, he did not really know the lifts like a lot of our athletes that come to us. So that's a very very special case, you know. Mm-hmm. What I mean, because he basically lives in my, my hometown. Uh, you know, we need to spend, I think, 30 hours or something like that. That's what we had to do for a senior project. Um, so, yeah, you know, we had to kind of be together, you know, for a, a certain specific time. I and mean, I could teach him the lifts and, and teach him the, the little nuances, you know, and things like that. And really, that's the only time that, that I've, I've ever done that. I have never had a, a, a pure, you know, kind of newbie slash novice, you know, beginner in the gym come to me and just say, hey, I want to do powerlifting. You know what I mean? I'd say with that one exception, everybody has been in the gym lifting for a few years, um, possibly even done something kind of plug and play um, powerlifting programming wise, like 531 or, you know, done some, you know, starting strength, something like that. Um, But yeah, other than that one case, I've never had to just up and teach somebody the lifts. What about um, nutritionally? I'm assuming, I'm totally assuming, I could be co- totally wrong, that um, when they have to diet for a weight class, is that more of a challenge than dealing with a physique athlete? The only thing that I would think, I'm like, but 
our beginning bodybuilders usually have done so much research on their own and it's kind of scattered and prioritization is a little jacked up. Whereas a powerlifter might be fresh and have never been exposed to it. Is, do y'all find that one of those is like more difficult to deal with than the other? Unlearning or unteaching or breaking down their like old thoughts or just starting from scratch? What happens more often with a powerlifting client? Um, I, I'll take that one. I, yeah. I think, um, well, a lot of the times, to be honest, it's I'm talking powerlifters out of cutting down a weight class. Um, like we get, <clears throat> because we, we get a lot of intermediates and, yeah. um, the progress from beginner to intermediate is relatively rapid. And then there's kind of this, the syndrome that intermediates get where they think they start questioning everything because they have a very difficult time accepting that the progress is going to be slower going from intermediate to what their version of advanced is, which may not be advanced on the platform compared to others. It'll be okay. advanced compared to where they started, right? Um, and I've gone through this myself. I'm sure we all have where they get to this thing where they start, oh, it turns into like this kind of educated program hopping or where the novice is doing it because it's like, ooh, shiny object, ooh, shiny object. Yeah. The, <laughs> the, the intermediate does it because they are keep expecting to make uh, – early stage intermediate gains versus early stage advanced gains and it doesn't happen so they go fuck I'm doing something wrong and they keep switching and they keep switching mm -hmm. um, and then they go well well, maybe if I can drop a weight class oh look at that I'd have a, a Wilkes go over 400 you know um, which is actually the exact opposite thing they need to do uh, which is be patient and try to put on muscle and you know accept mm -hmm. that it's going to take some time so I, I had that conversation more than I, I expected before I got into this of talking intermediates out of trying to cut down to you know lean levels which isn't very sustainable for basically a temporary increase in it's kind of like you you reduce the ceiling of your ability to, to progress but you get closer to it and they don't realize it's that trade-off so like they might be here this might be their their let's say they're a 93 kg they should be a 93 kg lifter and they could get to here but they go right well if i'm an 83 kg lifter i'll be so much closer to my ceiling and it's like yeah you increased your wilkes but you're Absolute strength is lower, and your Wilkes is not going to get any higher, kind of thing. So um, the same talk we have with bodybuilders happens often with powerlifters, then. Oh yeah, the, you know, same the kind same, of symptom. Yeah, the I want it now. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, um, maybe Brad can answer the procedural stuff of this. It's actually difficult teaching them because I haven't had a new powerlifter in a while. Yeah, and that's that's actually really really good stuff to to listen to, Eric. You know and. I've been I've been looking forward to this podcast just so I can hear you hear some of your ideas as as you're doing your programming with me. <laughs> um, so yeah, just to comment on Eric's thing, that's for me that's so eye opening because with me right now my performance is, is such that it's I'm I'm better in the the 74 kg class. And to hear Eric say, well, you know what, if I if I should be an 83 er and I'm I'm here with my 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 74 kg. You know what? How how far far can I push that? You know what I mean. Whereas if I kind of stayed in the eighty three, you know, there's there's all this room right here, and that's a very eye opening thing for me. I love these kind of things where I have these aha moments. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then guys. again, you've been lifting for a really long like. Yeah. He, you know what I mean? You're like, a slightly different case because you 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 got into powerlifting once you were already a professional natural bodybuilder. So I'm not expecting you to like. If we just grow some 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 muscle, yeah. we're gonna get you to. You know, so I think in your case, and it's also you're in one of those annoying positions where your kind of natural settling weight is between the two weight classes. For sure. So yeah. unlike most, it's like you get to kind of look at, all right, if I hang around my my low end of my set point, or if I just kind of don't worry about it at all, and I'd be a light 83er, which one makes me better? Um, and I, I think I think you're doing it right because I mean, you you got a silver medal in the Masters of Nationals, so I mean, you're in a position where if you are, you, you actually probably should be playing the field. You know, your average lifter who goes into nationals, it's like, you know, I lift where I lift and I get as strong as I can because there's going to be 40 people in my weight class and, uh, you know, whatever. Um, in your yeah. position, you have a legitimate shot at potentially winning, a, you know, a title. So you would look at, okay, would I do better in the 83s or would I do better in the 74s? So I think you're doing it right, but um, so I wouldn't necessarily classify you as an intermediate, you might be an intermediate powerlifter because you're new to the sport, uh, relatively compared to bodybuilding. But I wouldn't say you're an intermediate in terms of development. Mm -hmm. yeah. How yeah, still just it's, it's stuff I'm going to put right up here. You know, <laughs> <laughs> just going to keep it in his back pocket. 
Um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so then I think a very general misconception or stereotype is that everyone's cutting weight for every meat. Right. And how yeah. often do you even recommend that? Like say if for every 10 lifters that you guys have, how many do you find that you're like, all right, this would be a good idea for us versus like just eat and lift and grow and we'll get there one day. Mm -hmm. Well, and we really have to kind of almost differentiate two things. You know I mean? There's, there's long-term cutting slash weight slash fat loss, trying to make a weight class. And then there's like, okay, I'm 86 kg. I want to make the 83, right. you know, uh, kg category. And we're just going to cut, you know, a water weight for like, you know, five days. There's a mm -hmm. huge differentiation there. Yep. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, Elaborate for And me, like please. Eric, on, on like Eric, I'm, I, with a lot of my athletes, I don't really advise cutting for a weight class. I like to either maintain or possibly, you know, grow into the new one. Um, however, does that necessarily mean that, say, for example, like someone that's, that's routinely walking around at 96 kg should not compete in the 93s. No, they're, they're close enough that as long as we're progressing in the gym, we don't necessarily have to control weight. We can just leave it alone. Uh, you know, go with a, with a water slash weight cut protocol the week before the meet, drop six pounds of water, make the 93s, compete, go back to training as usual when you're done. Um, so yeah, that's a, a huge differentiation because when you cut water, for to make a weight class the the week before a meet, it, it's not real mass. You know, it's just all fluids that are that are being yeah. eliminated, uh, and you and it's not going to affect your performance, or at least a lot of the the um, you know anecdotal research that Eric's kind of been going over for as far as fasting for 14 hours prior to a meet, it doesn't inhibit your 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 performance. Uh, um, so that's pretty routine. Now, if we're talking long term. You know, someone that's 102 kgs trying to gradually lose weight, you know, to make the 93s, that's a different scenario. And, right. and that's kind of like where Eric was talking about the procedure of doing that can get tricky. Um, and, and, you know, for the most part, in a nutshell, you just got to do it really slow, really slow, you know, and you almost don't even really watch things like weekly you know, our daily calories, I guess I should say, or, or your, your rate of loss per week, you really got to look at almost weekly and monthly calories and your rate of loss per month, you know, versus more rapid approaches like we're used to with, you know, our bodybuilders. And so, you know, it's, it's things that I've outlined before. Let's just stay at maintenance calories for, you know, 20 days of the month. And then 10 days of the month, we go into a, a precise depth deficit where and it doesn't even actually be, be precise macros but we got to make sure that 10 days out of the month you know and we'll kind of structure it by the week we got to be in a 500 calorie deficit so that by the end of the month we've lost two-thirds of a pound or what have you you know um so yeah and then you set it up just such that you know whatever your cycle is this portion of the week is is maintenance this portion of the week is is deficit rinse and repeat and then just watch, 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 watch. I love that. Yeah, I've definitely that. seen. Uh, I've definitely, I've definitely seen like basically two approaches you can take with with uh, strength athletes to diet, and one is more kind of like theoretical because I've don't get the opportunity to use it. So the first one is like Brad's talking about. You just kind of sneak it off and you go very slow. And I've definitely seen that. Kind of the slower you go with the strength athlete, the better it seems to do for performance. Um, and then the other approach is to say, right, well, if you're going to be slowly dieting for a long time, you're going to be making your performance just kind of subpar for a long period. Maybe it'd be better just to diet a bunch of weight off quickly, go to maintenance, and then train from there. Uh, the problem with that, though, like, I, that's actually something that, that Lyle has said a few times to me. I'm like, ah, fair enough. You know, he's like, why would you have training at 80% for eight months when you could just take a one month, diet all off, have shitty training, and then just regain all your strength and get back to it? And I kind of think, you know, it's a fair enough point, but um, a lot of the times powerlifters come to us with a meet in mind, and it's we don't get them in some time point where they're, you know, a year and a half away from a comp always. We get them, unless they're just kind of steady state in our roster. So I think that is definitely like a reasonable strategy. It's never one I've had an opportunity to implement because it's hard to know what that will do to their performance, how to work it into a periodization cycle, et cetera. So I just want to kind of give a little, little shout out to, to people who, because I know some strength athletes do that. They'll just be like, yeah, I'm, I, December sucks. You know, I just diet, but then I'm not competing until 
July or whatever. I think that's reasonable. Um, and one thing, just to put it out there for everyone's listening, the water cutting stuff, yeah, that's it's almost like we should differentiate that. But often people hear that and they'll take it too far. Like if you're more than 3% of your body weight above the weight class, you probably shouldn't be hoping to make it out when you're a week out. That's probably kind of a safe range for most people. I think Brad would probably agree with that. But if you're more than that and you need to diet, and then you need to consider, should I be dieting unless I'm, you know, relatively advanced or qualifying for something, you know, that kind of thing. So tell yeah. me about these uh, water weight loss protocols. Uh, in, in a nutshell, basically, you, you eat a lot of carbs, sodium and, 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 and drink a lot of water. And then you taper that down until you're not, not eating a lot of carbs, you're eating more fat, um, not drinking much water and your sodium slow, and then you do a 14 hour fast, which includes the sleeping the night prior, which is basically something I took straight out of intermittent fasting and the anecdotal things they found of what they could get away with and still perform well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, get on the platform. Most of our clients are doing um, IPF affiliate meets, uh, so they end up having a two hour weigh in, and then you know, you spend the next two hours getting off the platform and getting an electrolytes, water, carbs, and then a little bit of protein, having some digestion time, and then hitting their first squat. That, that's it in a nutshell. Um, but there's actually a really cool, and we might have to find this later, there's a really cool schematic that, that Bryce from the Strength Athlete, he made that kind of showed the relationship of those variables over time, kind of how they start high, like your water, carb, and sodium loading, and then they, how they come down, and then right after you weigh in, they come back up which kind of helps people look at that. Is that on the TSA website? It's either on the TSA website or it might be on like Bryce's uh, Instagram uh, Instagram or his Facebook. Okay. We keep talking about, uh, for the people listening to, we keep saying Bryce over and over, which is uh, Bryce Lewis, who is an elite power lifter um, and coaching client of Eric's for how many years now? Six, believe Six it or not. Six years, and, and he, yeah. he owns the Strength Athlete. Which is a right. freaking tremendous resource for powerlifters. Um, yeah, he's a he's probably honestly at this point he has probably coached more powerlifters than I have because that's mm -hmm. all he's doing and he's not doing a PhD to set all his time up. So he's he's <laughs> a, a very experienced coach in his own right, as is Chris Aiden, Eric Bodhorn. Um, let's see who else they got there. I can't Ani. remember if Joe Stanick is still interning with them, mm -hmm. um, but then Ani Jazzarelli. So lots of shout outs to give to the the peeps. Yeah. yeah. But they have a lot of um, awesome resources on their website. He does a real good job. They do. Yep. Very cool. cool. Um, is yours? Is uh, do you follow that same protocol ish, Brad? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. That's. I think the biggest thing that that I, that I always really really try to uh, um, um, have an athlete focus on is you know once you make weight you have to think about we're in a deficit of water, sodium, and carbs here. And we need to try as best we can to get that deficit made up. And then obviously you can't just possibly shove in tons of carbs, sodium, and water in that two hour time period, but we needed to make our best effort to get that back in, um, you know, before you make the platform. So a lot of times I'll just kind of outline little strategies as to how to get, you know, all of that back, back kind of the baseline. Uh, again, but yeah, otherwise exactly what Eric said. I mean, I've got numbers that I kind of, like, again, because I'm the numbers geek, I've got a little spreadsheet where they, it's all individualized. They push in their, their, they punch in their actual wa water intake that they normally take in, you know, what their sodium is, and then it kind of lays it out for them in a seven day format. Um, but it, it, it's exactly what Eric said, you know, if you were to just summarize it all in a nutshell. What's the furthest out yeah. that you start that? Seven it's days. usually always seven days. It's always a yeah. week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It lines up nicely with your taper. That, that's that's the thing because you, you, you're going to be dropping carbs and messing with your water, messing with your soda. You're not going to have – it's possible you might not have very good training. But if you only have to do like you know, three singles at 80% and then three singles at, at 60% and then take a day off and, and compete and it doesn't really matter kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's it's also very individual. That's one thing I found is that some people are not at all affected by it. Some people are. Some people do that and they only lose two percent of their body weight in a week. Other people lose like four or five percent of their body weight, which is like whoa, you know. Um, and I definitely prefer it to something like sauna because when you when you sauna and you sweat and you lose more electrolytes because it's coming out of sweat, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, so it, I think it's, it's, it's a better approach. It typically seems to affect platform less than other approaches that people take. Um, and yeah, it's, it, it really, it goes hand in hand with some of the smart attempt selection stuff. Like you don't want to be opening with like 97% of your max on squats if you cut, cut weight because you don't know how you're going to be feeling. So it's smart to be, if, if there's one, if your most, your most conservative opener should be your first squat, you know, if you cut weight. Yeah. And you said, um, Brad, you had mentioned some ways to fill. Is that like what Pedialyte and donuts? Like what? Are you, <laughs> like what are the things? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like what are your? Yeah. What are the things that you say? Is like okay, we need to get you full and and feeling good again without being overly yeah. bloated or digestive issues or things exactly, like that. Exactly. Yeah. And really, to be honest with you, especially with with my my more um, you know intermediate power lifters, I like to run a little experimental week. Okay. Um. And and so it's a great idea. Like if I'm planning a taper at the end of a mesocycle of training and say that we're going to test. Um, you know, I'll say, let's go ahead and try this water cut protocol and just, first of all, see how it works. Um, you know, how much weight do you lose? How do you feel? How's your performance when you do test? You know what I mean? And so I, I, I really like to, to have the opportunity to do that, you know? Um, and, and then likewise, we can kind of bounce those things off of each other okay so what there's what we're going to want to do as soon as you get off the the scale you know i want to i want a container of pedialyte and i want you to down it okay uh and then let's kind of play with our, our our food selection here you know what i mean let's try go ahead and have something easily digestible that's got a lot of carbs in it um you know let's go ahead and if you've, you've got the chance to do it before your training you know let's get a shower because people don't realize how much of your body absorbs water through its pores, you know, just when you go in and get a, get a shower. Um, you know, let's, let's get you as much as we can to normal. And then, of course, if, if lifting the day, you know, doesn't seem to work, we can kind of evaluate that. We can say, well, what didn't we do? What, what can we change to make it better? Should we even do this at all, you know? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I really like to have an experimental portion. And then, you know, we'll just kind of bounce ideas off of each other. If a person say that a lot of their, their carbohydrate intake comes from, you know, brown rice or other really, really soluble uh, sources of fiber. Well, you know what? At least for this period of time, we're not going to want to have that. You know, we're going to want to go with more rapidly digestive stuff, maybe not vegetables per se, but just something, you know, that doesn't have a lot of fiber in it, something that, that you know uh, it gets rapidly digested that we can get in you as quickly as possible. And then also we can kind of find out how do they perform, you know, on the platform that day. You know, mm -hmm. if every time you finish a deadlift, you get lightheaded, we probably get get more sodium in you because you're getting a, blop, a drop in blood pressure. And maybe we need to get that blood pressure back up again, get more of that sodium back in you, you know. So, yeah, I really like a trial run. I really, really do. And um, not that, you know, I've ever had anything bad happen, but at the same time, it never hurts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you don't want to be the guy who, or the gal who is, you know, 200 grams over just because you didn't trial it out before, you know, and then having to be like, oh my God, what do I do this morning? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go find a gym with a sauna or, you know, find a very uh, sweet pack of gum and spit in a cup, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, how many? Which, oh, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Which, which has to happen sometimes, but yeah. I'd like to avoid it. Yeah. Um, how many, you say a trial run? How far out would you, like, if you have someone who's about to compete for the first time, they approach you, my meet's in three months, how far out would you want that trial run in order for them to recover to do the actual uh, meet week protocol? At least a month? Would you, I mean, are you just like anytime it's, there's a... It, it, it's very variable. I know okay. myself, I did, a, I did a trial run the week before my, my oh. first actual meet that I made wait. I, okay. I did it exactly one week before. Uh, I wasn't as meticulous. I just kind of played with it a little bit. Uh, and then I was more meticulous the week after when I actually, you know, made weight uh, for my for my meat. Um, and, and both times it worked very, very well. Um, what I'm really, really interested in seeing is as I get more experience doing this is do we get that same effect over time? You know what I mean? Does your body kind of start to get used to that? And so the effect of the water cut actually gets less and less and less and less uh, over mm. time. You know, I'm sure probably Eric has, has got, you know, some pretty good ideas of how that might look like on paper. But, 
you know, I plan on doing this for a long time and, and we're going to find out for sure if, if the, the, the response is the same each and every time I do it, time after time after time after dozens and dozens of times. Yeah. Um, for most of my athletes, like, for, for example, I just, I just coached an athlete who we had an eight-week block of training leading up to her meet. And we really didn't have a chance to, to, to do a trial run. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, luckily, the person was pretty savvy in the kitchen. They got a great response. Uh, they dropped like a four and a half percent of their, their body weight and still performed good on the day. Um, but I, I really, I mean, I don't, sometimes you just don't have time. And I would not feel really comfortable myself doing a trial run right in the middle of somebody's mesocycle where it's a, a more volume-based mesocycle or an in, intensity-based mesocycle. I don't know if I want to hamper their, their training, you know, or at least take a chance of hampering that training. Yeah, I would just do it during a deload week, you know, like the last deload week they have before they yeah. they have their taper. Um and, and yeah, you know, in my experience, the cutting weight thing, it stays pretty much, it, it's the, I, I almost wonder if you did it like back to back weeks, if the second week wouldn't be as good. But, um, I, I don't know of any, I mean, like obviously the body is closely guarding it's like, you know, blood sodium levels and it's, and it's water levels and stuff like that. But so much of, you know, manipulating this stuff is just, um, like physiology, so it's just not not that anything isn't in the body, but I, I don't know if it can really. I th- I think that the the water cutting is still going to happen, you know, like no matter how many times you do it. And if you look at experienced competitors who are always just one two kgs over their their class, they're always able to cut weight. So if anything, I think people get better at it. They get better at they get less stressed by the process. Mm. They um, yeah. They, I think the hardest thing, like with the approach that we're talking about is really not that extreme. Like you get down to half your normal sodium intake, you get down to half normal water intake, and then you have basically a, a, a couple of days of keto, essentially. Um, it's not like what you might read about with some really extreme approaches. It just happens to be very effective. So you can see things like a, like Brad said, almost 5% of their body weight lost in a week. Um, I would say that's probably on the higher end though. Most people are losing, you know, two, three, 3% is probably the average. Um, and, uh, but yeah, the, like the first time you do it, because basically you're loading water, loading carbs, loading sodium, you're probably, if anything, gaining weight Mm -hmm. uh, in the first half of the week. And then you might be not seeing the scale actually go down substantially until you're like 48, 72 hours out from the meat. And that can Mm -hmm. be pretty scary to someone who's doing it for the first time. They're like, "Uh, this plan is making it worse. (laughs) Yeah, Um, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, what's the... Um, I want to say like recommended, like in your, in your opinions, how often do you ideally have a, a career power lifter compete per year? Some of that's going to be dictated by, um, how good they are. Like <clears throat> if there's someone who, uh, it also depends on their country. So I'll, I'll give you an example, like with a couple of New Zealanders I work with, um, if they're good enough to compete in, uh, an international competition, that means they're placing top two in their weight class at nationals. So they have to do nationals to get to international, but to get to nationals, they have to do their regionals. So they're pretty much always going to be doing three. And then they could potentially do like a club meet, just kind of like a local uh, one that doesn't really matter. So maybe four. Uh, but I find two to four meets per year is probably the sweet spot for most people. Brad, um, if, they're, if they're a career powerlifter. Okay. Brad? You know, I wish to be honest with you, I had more career powerlifters. You know, <laughs> I think <laughs> really the only, the only career, real career powerlifter that I've got on my roster is like me. You know, um, <laughs> well, I, I would agree. You know, okay. two to four, two to four would 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 definitely. It, it's as much as I would feel comfortable doing. Um, you know, a, a frequency of meets. You know, and well, I guess um, to define career power, you guys are talking about people who do this at high national and international levels. Um, what about someone who just loves competing and they, like, what, I guess at what point does it get, okay, now because you're competing so often, we're not making the progress you'd like to see? Exactly. And, and a lot of times you got to have that talk, you know, with the yeah. athlete. Because, I mean, Eric remembers this. I mean, I got the bug. I got the bug bad. I watched him in 2009, and it was the first ever time I, I, I even witnessed a powerlifting meet. And I was like, I'm doing this after every mesocycle. 
I'm going to do a mesocycle and I'm going to do a meet and I'm going to do another well mesocycle and I'm going to do a yeah. meet, you know? Uh-huh. And, and I think that's, I think that's fine as long as you set up the expectation of the client to say, look, this, that's okay to do this now. You know, you're very, very beginner in this. You can honestly expect probably a new PR every time you do a meet mm-hmm. 8, 10, 12, 14 weeks apart. But there's going to come a time when you're going to be disappointed. You know, you're going to not like what your your performance was and your body's going to adapt. You're just not going to get those same kind of, you know, that, that that same progression, you know, for meet to meet to meet to meet. And so that's always something you want to prepare that really enthusiastic, you know, novice body or novice power lifter. That's like, I'm, I'm just going to do every meet I I possibly can, you know? Um, so yeah, that you always got to have that talk. Yeah. But could that be beneficial in someone's learning to perform in that environment for the first, say, two years of their career. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah, okay. I mean, um, I still I still think probably the magic number is two to four per year. Okay. Um, that fits nicely in with, you know, a, a good block of, you know, when I say block, I guess a, uh, a couple of mesocycles of, of training that, that lead up to a meet. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're doing, you know, like five a year, then, then you're, you're, you know, you're thinking, okay, that's barely, that's like, five, eight week blocks with some deloads in there. And then you're like, just really hoping that it makes sense. Or yeah. maybe some of those meets you just don't peak for at all. Mm-hmm. Um, you just kind of go right. We're building up, but, um, no matter what I've, I've tried to have people who just rock into rock up to a meet and just don't even worry about it. This is just a meet you need to do to qualify. We don't care if you get PRs or not. Um, therefore it should not be stressful, but it always ends up being stressful. Uh, whether it's just the adrenaline, really? being, the adrenaline of being on the platform, being in front of people, different environment, uh, just being in that arousal state. It doesn't matter if they pull, you know, just their openers, you know, or pull squad and bench just their openers. Uh, I think a lot of it is the psychological and and the time span they have to be turned on, you know, Mm -hmm. to to do that. Because meets take for freaking forever. So it invariably, most people have a shitty week of training the week after a meet, if not a shitty two weeks of training. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I like to plan in, uh, you know, weeks of training that will be manageable even in a, a not very strong state. Um, and that's hard to do when you've got, you know, five, six meets to do in a year. Um, so yeah, I, I, I tend to, I, I agree that, yeah, plenty of platform time is good to get someone used to performing on the platform, but, uh, you, and, and yes, you can progress at a quick rate as a novice, but yeah, any, any more than two to four meets a year, I think it's probably, uh, counterproductive. Yeah. Um, Whenever you have an athlete that either was a bodybuilder and now wants to powerlift, was a powerlifter and now wants to bodybuild, um, do you find that you program incredibly differently year-round or is it only different leading up to the stage or leading up to a meet? I think I asked that right. Yeah, it, I think <laughs> I'll, I'll tackle this one okay. first, but I, I think it definitely depends on what are they most, in their mind, do they see themselves as a powerlifter or a bodybuilder, or are they a true dual athlete? Um, Which is rare, huh? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm like one of the few true dual athletes I've met. Most people tend to lean one way or the other after they experience. I've always been in love with both since 2006, you know, mm-hmm. and 2007 respectively. Um However, even me, I get put into the camp of training for one or the other just because of logistics. Like if I'm doing a you know, three-year PhD and a one-year master's, I'm not going to do bodybuilding. To be honest, I haven't been doing as many calf raises as I would normally, you know, kind of thing. Like I've been training much more like a power lifter. Uh-huh. So some of it is temporal, and then a lot of it is in terms of the, the timing of where they are related to comps. And then a lot of it is what are they most interested in. Um, because if they're really, really interested in being a power lifter, but they have a background as a bodybuilder, really you just do enough to kind of keep their physique and then you make space in their training to do, to get them familiar and really good at the lifts and to get them used to recruiting, you know, everything on a one RM and grinding through that stuff, which they're probably not used to. They've right. probably done, you know, widow makers with squats and things like that, but they've never done it, you know, a true one RM at their max capacity. And that takes time to develop that skill. So, so yeah, um, and it does flux in and out of being more bodybuilding focused and more powerlifting focused, depending on where they're at in their their competitive cycle. Same with you, Brad. 
Well, I guess another consideration too is, um, sorry, I know I just like asked you a question and took it over. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we love you. <laughs> oh, shit. Anyways, um, I already forgot that question also. So my bad guys. Um, but what I was going to say, question, the question was, how do we work with dual athletes? And you're going to go me first then Brad. And then I took the middle, but I don't remember. Okay, you go ahead, Brad. I'm going <laughs> to shut up. You go ahead. Uh, dual athletes, well, I, I, programming. No, to be honest with you, I, I have not had a lot of, you know, quote, unquote, career dual athletes. You know okay. what I mean? It's kind of like we're, we're cutting for the bodybuilding stage. Just go ahead and do a meet, you know, on the way. Um, that, that's kind of what my experience has been. It's yeah. been more with or like, okay, I got on stage. I need to stay motivated for the year here because – Otherwise, I'm just going to quit training. You know, well, you, we, let's let's kind of think about this powerlifting thing. You know, that's sometimes a great way to stay motivated. And, you know, those people that need that that end goal in order to get in the gym, you know, that's one avenue that we can cross. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's a tough thing to be, in my opinion, in a way, it's a tough thing to be a career dual athlete. I mean, it, it really is, in my opinion, because a lot of my 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 folks that have come to me with a powerlifting background and now they want to do bodybuilding. That last few weeks in the gym, few months, they hate it. They absolutely hate it. They feel weak. Their loads are way down. We're having to auto-regulate, you know, just to get the volume in that we need. They hate it. It is really, really demotivating to see a person that loves their training just all of a sudden, they I don't even want to go to the gym. You know, it's like I get there and I can't wait to get out, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a hard thing to see, and and, and that's why I, that's why I, I'm of the opinion that a you know a dual a true dual athlete is a tough thing to do. Right? Do you find that it's more um, bodybuilders go into powerlifting to find some shit to do in the off season, or powerlifters like I'm kind of jacked? Sure, I'll diet and be on stage. I'd say much, much more, less. Yeah, much more the ahead. first, right, Brad? I mean, is that what you're going to say? Much more people who are yeah, exactly. yeah. How many of those, yeah. okay, so what, whenever you see a bodybuilder be like, I'll do this in the off season, how many of them actually like love it? And how many of them are like, all right, that was cool, but like never again? Oh man, some people get, get the, are like, wow, this is what I've been waiting for. This is everything yeah. I, everything I hate about bodybuilding is not here. Like, <laughs> yeah. um, mm -hmm. I don't have to be naked on stage in a Speedo. I don't have to shave my body. I don't have to cut nearly as hard, even if I do make a weight class. Uh, it's not subjective. Either I lifted the weight or I didn't. I yeah. feel like I'm an athlete again rather than I, I train and then I, it's a kind of a beauty pageant, you know. So um, for bodybuilders who are more have an athlete mindset, not that don't, those who don't get like powerlifting don't, but if they have, if they come from a more analytical athletic background, uh, I find that they might love lifting weights and want to find an outlet for competing, and they've gotten into bodybuilding. And they do well, and that, that's fine and dandy. They like it, but they have to ignore a bunch of things they don't like about bodybuilding, or just accept it. And then they try powerlifting, and especially if they're good at it, they're like, "Why the hell was I ever a bodybuilder?" And that's, they're they're done with it. Like <laughs> yeah. I've had a few who have just done it once, and they're done. They never bodybuild again. So, yeah. Yeah. And Did we lose him? I think we did. Oh, no. Oh, there he is. Oh, he's back. There he is. Okay, can you start that over? We kind of lost you for a sec. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, like you and I talked about, Andrea, in our talk, um, uh, I think it was in, in the last podcast, number three, when you take a really good bodybuilder, you know, like a elite bodybuilder with per perfect structure like a Jeff Alberts, I don't see Jeff Alberts ever getting on the, on the powerlifting platform. <laughs> you know what I mean? When you get a really good bodybuilder, that's just like they, they've almost like reached nirvana in a way. Uh, now, obviously, I don't know a lot of elite, <laughs> you know, bodybuilders, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's 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 kind of one of those things where I don't know if I, you could get, you know, the exact opposite either. Like, for example, Bryce. Bryce has done bodybuilding, you know, and he was a pretty darn good bodybuilder, you know. But will he ever, he's really good at powerlifting, you know, and will he ever go back to the bodybuilding stage? You know, I think that's always a, an interesting little, you know, you know, quandary for that kind of an athlete. Yeah. And I think another... and even the really strong, really strong bodybuilders who are extremely good, it's, I think they're, they're so much rewarded by bodybuilding. Like people don't know Brian Whitaker is actually really freaking strong. Well, but bodybuilder. Yeah. <laughs> 
I just I just don't see him getting into powerlifting because he is the you know objectively the the best natural bodybuilder on the planet at the moment. You know, so it's like why would he kind of thing? Yeah. Um, unless he just did it and absolutely fell in love with it. But I mean, there, there's a lot of guys like that. I think, uh, you know, Dave Gooden had, uh, some, some Texas records in, in powerlifting and he would do it more for fun on the side. But, um, yeah, I think for the most part, I think 3DMJ has a lot of experience with powerlifters, but many of them get into it because it is a, a way, an outlet at, at, for their off seasons, um, um, or they started as a bodybuilder and they, like I mentioned, for whatever reasons, they decided powerlifting was much more for them and then they became that purely. Yeah. And I think I'm one of the, those weird cases where, um, like it didn't feel like a performance sport for me. I don't, mm -hmm. I, it felt like another day in the gym for me. Um, yeah. That's because you come from a real sport background. <laughs> well, a lot of, um, I get a lot of shit for that, to be honest. Um, mm. by a lot mm. of power lifters. You know, that don't... And, and I, I, go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, it's well, just... just <laughs> <laughs> every time. All right, you win, Brad. Go. You get three, you get three extroverts on the same program. There's no shortage of talking, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, well, I was, I was just going to say, that really surprised me with you, Andrea, because I, I really thought you were going to dig it. And, I mean, let's face it. You're freaking good. You're strong, you know? Um, but at the same time, I mean, I just got to admire you. You're just like, mm, man, it's not for me, you know? And I think that just speaks volumes for, you know, you just your courage, your honesty. Um, you know, you're good at it. You were good at it, but it just was not for you. And you weren't afraid and, and ashamed to, to say that. You know it's, what I mean? Yeah. And, and the thing is, I, it's not that I think I would never do it again. I feel like it's almost, this is going to sound bad. Okay. So like whenever you see, um, certain people getting on, on a bodybuilding stage for reasons other than the sport, um, which I'm not going to go too far into, but it's like, okay, you don't love this. This was either a vanity choice or a help me get through something else in my life kind of choice but you don't actually like want to be here for the reasons that like the true athletes want to be here. I don't get offended by it, but I'm like, what are you doing kind of thing? That's almost the same way I feel with powerlifting is like, I, I because I feel like it's another day in the gym. If all four of you were competing in a powerlifting meet and you're like, Andrea, come in on this, I'd be like, yeah, because it's our thing and we're going to do it together. But if there wasn't like a reason like that, I feel like it's almost um, like dishonorable to go on the platform without the intentions of like, this is my sport. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I, just, like, yeah. I feel like it's yeah. almost offensive to the people that are so great at it and it's their life's work. Mm -hmm. but, okay, that was all. That's no, all I, I feel you. Say. Yeah, and I yeah, just... I mean, if you, don't, if you don't love something, don't do it. That's, that's as simple as And the thing is, is like, in the gym, I do it all the time. Like, I still squat bench <laughs> all the time and I, and I love it. It's just that I feel like uh, competition is a very sacred thing for the athletes that really do love it. And I don't want to take away from them. Yeah, and I, I think the difference is, is that you, at the age of seven, were a competitive gymnast, and I was a, you know, competitive fantasy book reader. So it's like <laughs> not exactly the same. Yeah, um, yeah, and yeah. I guess so too, that's I think, it. Is the the rush? I didn't feel. I'm like, oh, it's just, I'm not flipping yeah. on a four inch wide beam. That's a rush. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's just a different kind of rush. So like this, it's like another squat. Got it. Um, anyways, mm -hmm. not to make this about me. Um, why? How dare you talk on the podcast? I know. How dare I? How dare I? <laughs> <laughs> but it is, um, I guess, uh, I just didn't want to say that. That was all. I didn't want to offend anybody. Um, Brad? I don't think anyone, no, no one should be offended by <laughs> you someone surprised. not liking the sport they like, you know? I'm going to offend everybody. I don't like any sports except for bodybuilding, powerlifting, and Olympic lifting. <laughs> Well, okay, why did you, I think it is kind of uh, related to this, though, is you decided to try Olympic lifting. Why was that? Honestly, I I love anything related to lifting weights, you know? Okay. Um, I almost did a, uh, did a strongman comp. Um, That's cool. But uh, I realized that I was not a strongman. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> 
No, I almost did a little novice strongman comp around here, um, but it, it just there because there is some pretty serious like anaerobic cardio components and um, injury rates are really high, and it's you have to have specific implements. It was just like you know Olympic lifting. If you have Olympic bars and bumper plates, you're good. Um, so anyway, but I've always loved like Olympic lifting and thought. Um, I remember Berto and I did a powerlifting meet and there was a couple Olympic lifters who were competing in it, just kind of like their coach wanted them to do that in like a strength block just to, you know, do it. And, um, high bar ATG squatters, terrible bench. And then, you know, uh, didn't know what their maxes were on, on conventional deadlift because they're used to doing like clean pulls, but still strong guys. And it didn't matter what they lifted because as soon as they said to us that they're Olympic lifters, we were like, Oh, like you're, you're like the <laughs> God of the weight room. Like you yeah. somehow get that, that weight over your head, you know, in one movement and, and you can probably, you know, a good Olympic lifter can, can clean and jerk the, the, the squat of an intermediate power lifter, you know? So it's, it's, uh, very, very impressive. I think there's a higher level of technical skill and athleticism involved in Olympic lifting than there's power lifting. Um, and I think most of the time what I see is like power lifters respect Olympic lifters and Olympic lifters will, will uh, tolerate power lifters, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's some Olympic lifters who I train with who they, they joke that the power lifters are all just like broken wannabe Olympic lifters. But anyway, it's, it's fun camaraderie. But anyway, so I, I wanted to get into it and, um, I would still be doing it if it wasn't for the fact that um, it was just I, I don't have the mobility it, and it was really beating up my joints to do it. Um, it might be because I got into it at 30. Uh, it might just be the structure of my hips, but I, I really struggled to do um, the lifts in a way that it, it got. I did it for a year and a half and it just got progressively more frustrating um, and painful. So mm -hmm. I, I, I realized I would have to either give up low bar back squatting and then figure out a way to do powerlifting with working around my hip, which is what I currently do, or just do Olympic lifting and not do back squats and just do front squats, which is suboptimal. And it's just like, uh, I don't like either one of these decisions, but okay. it's a lot more fun to be a good powerlifter than a terrible Olympic lifter struggling to get to below average, you know? Yeah. So, well, I think something so important that was, about that, what you just said is the, the exchange, right? You're, you, at some point, like we say, dual athletes are hard to come up, but it's like there's a reason for that. Um, everything comes at a cost. You can only do so, so much stress on the body. Where do you want to put it? Um, and then also, too, when I find someone who comes to us who's um, never competed in either, and I find that more than ever I hear people being like, I love lifting. I don't know if I want to do bodybuilding or powerlifting yet or first or whatever. And... Um, I guess a decision-making factor that I always like to bring up is that if you do a contest prep, that can hinder quite a bit of time in your strength slash physique gains, whereas if you just go enter a powerlifting meet, like you're still always making progress towards your bodybuilding goals. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And so I just, mm -hmm. um, the cost is just a much lower cost, I guess, to, to do powerlifting than it is bodybuilding. And one will always contribute to the other and not the other way. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I, I think people look at it and go, well, why isn't bodybuilding easy? That's, there's, you know, so long as I can do progressive overload on my muscle groups, I'll get bigger. And then they forget that quote unquote bodybuilding is very different than competitive bodybuilding. Yeah. Um, going through a diet is, yeah. is harder than anything. You what's know? what's uh, funny now that I train at uh, CrossFit gyms a lot, a lot of them will tell me. Um, because I've been in this natural bodybuilding community for years, they'll be like, well, I started doing bodybuilding stuff and then now I do CrossFit and I'm like, oh, when did you compete? And they're like, no, 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 I didn't. I'm like, wait, so you never did bodybuilding. Like mm -hmm. they, they think that training in a bro gym means I was doing bodybuilder stuff. <laughs> it's like, wait, 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 that's, that's really different, you know, but my immediate reaction is, oh, when did you compete? When was your last season? They're like, well, I never competed. I'm like, then you didn't do bodybuilding stuff because mm -hmm. the hard part isn't the training. I mean, if you love the gym, you know. Yeah, I yeah bodybuilding training. You can you could do it with machines. You can do it with yeah. free weights. You can do it with body weight if you're creative enough and mm -hmm. and know how to figure. I mean, you can do it and make progress training each body part once a week. You can do full body every day. There are, there are so many ways just to stimulate muscle tissue to grow. Yeah, and you could talk about what's optimal, but yeah, I mean, Olympic lifters get bigger, powerlifters get bigger, gymnasts gets bigger. Anyone who 
you know, puts progressive tension stress on their muscles is going to get bigger. So yeah, it's an easy, easy fit. And every strength conditioning coach does some quote unquote bodybuilding training with their athletes. But, um, so I, I, I guess in that sense, everyone's a bodybuilder who, who trains, but, um, but at the same time, it's, it's a far cry from competitive bodybuilding and people don't necessarily realize that until they go through the process of just how hard it can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you find that power lifters, Brad, have a really difficult time when you do make that decision to shit, even the week long water weight cut, is that difficult for some of them who've never dieted before? No, not really. You know, at at least not the people that I've worked with, you know, the people that I've worked with are, are, are pretty savvy with their nutrition. Um, and, and it's such a short period of time that their, their performance does not get hindered at all. And, and like Eric said, we're going to be smart about it. You're not going to do AMRAPs, you know, the mm-hmm. Thursday that you're at your lowest amount of carbs, you know, uh, we're going to set up your block of training. So that's your taper, your peak, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you know, over the long term, I've had a lot of, no, not just power lifters, but just a lot of people who really enjoy their training, um, pull the plug on a bodybuilding prep, you know, and it's, it's simply because until you've been sub, you know, 5% body fat and, and, and know what that feels like and be starving and see your strength go down in the gym and just every day, you know, be a struggle. Um, yeah, you really, you don't, you don't know what that feels like until you've been there. You know, yeah. you always see the IG posts of the people jacked and razor sharp and, and you know, et cetera. Oh, oh, I want to do that, you know, and boy, getting there is, is, it's a rough thing. It's a rough thing. And if you really want to try to find out, you know, how you are mentally, um, you know, that's when you want to go ahead and try to do a bodybuilding competition yeah. <laughs> where you have to juggle all of that stuff. You know, that, that last podcast that you guys did, I think it was number two. That was such a great podcast. You know, Excellent. when you were talking about the art of, of physique coaching and coaching your athlete through that period of time, you know, um, and yeah, to some extent, you know, I've got to agree with what you guys said in that podcast. You know, you, you in my opinion, you can't coach body competitive bodybuilding until you've been there. You know, you can't just tell somebody, OK, yeah, it's cardio every day and, and we'll go out down to 80 grams of carbs and, and we'll go that way for two weeks, you know, until you've yeah. been there. You probably better not just up and tell somebody to do that, you know. Yeah. That's a miserable feeling. Yeah. And another anecdotal thing, though, too, is like I I started with that, did it on my own, whatever, semi-starved. But something I didn't realize, um, even though I've come from a competitive gymnastics background, it's a different kind of competitive. um, I had to learn the skill of 1RMs. I didn't Mm. – I underestimated that skill, being like, I'm strong. What's the problem? And then I step mm-hmm. under a squat for the first time, and I'm like, um, I don't know if I can go down with this. And it's not even, like, scared for my life, but it's um, – with me, a lot of it was even – no matter how many times I'd squatted with my bodybuilding training, um, the holy shit factor, and I would always uh, drop too fast, come down with mm-hmm. just a, leaning a little too far forward, or whatever, and it just screws the whole thing up, you know? And that's something that I do admire about powerlifters and something that I've learned to do over the years, but that first – six months when I was like, why am I missing this? I can lift this. I know I can lift this. I can do 95% of this for six, but I can't do the five pounds more than that for one because in my mm-hmm. brain, it's like the one. So. Yeah, yeah. That's, and that's always an interesting, I, I can't remember when we were talking about this, but uh, I think it might've been on one of our meetings where I was talking yeah. about how the approach to training, um, needs to uh, to be catered to how well the person can transfer their quote unquote general strength to their one RM strength. Uh, and your traditional approach is like like Shiko where you're you know, most of the year until you're four weeks out from a meet, you're doing you know, loads in the the seventy to to eighty percent of one R M, some stuff up to eighty five. It's great if someone just gets slower when they go heavier and transfer that strength really well. Like I think Brad's a great example of of someone who I can throw moderate loads at, and then he can just perform on the platform very well with minimal time spent at like over ninety percent. But um, I think that's more common in men. They are they have less joint laxity. You know, it's not a, not a mental thing necessarily. Um, and in women who are hypermobile, especially someone who's come from a, a whole lifetime of, of gymnastics, uh, staying tight through the full range of motion on a squat under a one arm load is is 
feels different than doing it with 80% and you have to train that. Um, and then the mental state as well. Like, you know, um, there's something to be said for, you know, if, if you've only squatted 85% of your one RM and you go into a meet, when you walk out a true hundred percent, that feels heavy. And that's the last thing you want when you're mm-hmm. under a squat bar on a meet. So I think, yeah, how much time you spend training heavy should be really considered. Um, you know, some, some would just say, Oh, well it's, it's specific. So the more time, the better. But I think they forget that volume at, at that such high of a, an intensity costs more on the body, on the mind, yeah. and it, it can really run you down. So um, I tr- try to do, you know, uh, the, the appropriate amount of that, not not more than needed, because that that can that can have a pretty high cost, higher injury risk, all that stuff. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's funny because it, I'm kind of tangenting now, but you'll see people argue about like the. The old school, the old old argument was between like the the Russian approach and the American approach. Yeah, like the West Side Americans who are you know twice a week doing ME days, you know, balls to the wall, max out over ninety percent, you know, one to three RM kind of maxes almost every week. And then you had the Russians who seem to even when they hit hit the platform, they still have something left in the tank. There's always some reserve strength left, and you know they're always training around eighty eight five percent, only rarely going over ninety. And the point was is. Both were gold medalists, silver medalists, you know, doing really, really, really well in competition. So I think you have to definitely look at the individual lifter and no one approach is, is the best in every single scenario in, in terms of that argument. So, yeah. I didn't even think about that. Like when you said the hypermobile thing, um, yeah, going down, the, the, the biggest fix for me was like just slow down the eccentric on your bench and squat. Just make sure it ends up where it needs to go instead of letting it fall mm-hmm. down. Interesting. Oh yeah, and I Definitely. didn't even put that together as like maybe it has to do with the ability that I can squat so freaking easily, like a monkey. But <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Um, what that made me think about though is like one hundred five, one ten percent walkouts, right, for a squat or whatever. Um, I never got to the point in powerlifting because I only trained for like a year, geared towards that, leading up to my first meet. Um, when do you guys feel it? Um, it's important to introduce accessories to the big three as opposed to most people just doing all right doing the big three with um isolated accessories does that make sense like mm-hmm. walkouts rack pulls things like that as opposed to just being like here's your big three plus your leg curls extensions whatever yeah i i personally i don't do a whole lot of lift variations as accessory work okay um, that's what I was like trying if you to look say. at Thank my <laughs> yeah like I, a lot of powerlifting coaches will they will do variations on the big three, like, okay, we'll do bands, chains, board press, um, partials, deficits, mm-hmm. pause, you know, but they're all that word blank, you know, or space, squat, bench, or deadlift, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to me, it, yeah, you can make an argument that's more specific to the movement, but in my mind, if you're trying to do an accessory movement that is specific to the movement and you need to question their whole rationale on accessory movements, right? Why wouldn't you just do the main movement, you know? Um, and then you're okay. I'm trying to train a certain range of motion of the, the, uh, the movement. And then, then, then you go, okay, well, is that because you're, you're thinking that's where the sticking region is? Well, actually where you start to lose momentum is before that anyway. Uh, and you don't really know right where your weak point is. And is it even modifiable? Is that just the, the biomechanical position you're always going to be weaker in and it's just going to be weaker when you can deadlift more and more and more like you might mm-hmm. be able to deadlift 700 pounds and get stuck at the same spot when you deadlift at 500 so i i question that rationale so for me i look at it as the big three are great exercises don't get me wrong but they're not necessarily the best way to develop muscle development everywhere that may contribute to their performance mm-hmm. so when i program accessory work I'm thinking about what does this specific person need to do to get good muscular development to support the big three. And if they are, you know, have certain limb lengths, that means, you know, they have a super slight range of motion on a deadlift. Is the deadlift going to be that effective? You know, or do we need to be doing some, some, you know, other hip extension work and back extension work, uh, rows, things like that. And, you know, do, do they get great tricep delt and, and pec development from bench if they don't need to do other, other accessory work, that type of thing. So I, I kind of separate it in my mind in that way. Um, and I, I don't think that's the only way to do it. I just, I won't program accessory work unless I can justify it in my brain. And I have a tough time justifying, a, you know, 
some, some of the movements that are very, very common in powerlifting and that many powerlifting coaches would, would argue with me about that I don't use them. Brad? Yeah, I, you know, to be honest with you, I could sit here and just pick Eric's brain for like literally two hours. On, on Feel free. Subject. When, when to use bands, when to use chains, when to use heavy lockouts, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, and keep in mind, too, you know, Eric's, Eric's not speaking from a lack of experience. I've seen Eric do block pulls. I've seen Eric do block pulls with chains. Eric, you just recently did a whole stint where didn't you do like really heavy eccentric work and then had somebody actually help you? on the concentric portion on your bench press? Yeah, I've, yeah, it's, uh, I, I guess I should point that out. I have done all of the things I don't do now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've done them with not just That's myself, important. but with others. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've, I've ran, I ran West Side for, for years. Uh, I did that with clients and myself. I ran uh, Shiko variations, and I did a lot of the accessory work that Shiko really likes to use, like uh, paws, deadlifts, and a few other things that I don't do anymore. Um, and I've also taken approaches where it's kind of your, your typical power building, which is probably what I still do. Um, I've done bands, I've done chains, I've done deficits, I've done block pulls, I've done pause squats, I've done board presses, the, pretty much everything. Um, and, and I pay attention while I'm doing it. It's not like I just did it, you know? Yeah. So the, uh, the few things that I have, and, and here's my observation, having been in powerlifting, training and, and coaching for about a decade now is that accessory movements come in and out of favor. And, um, it's almost kind of like the emperor's new clothes thing. You know, like if a, if a popular coach is using it, being successful with his athletes, everyone says that's a good exercise. They all do it. And then if it goes out of favor for some reason, it goes away and something else happens. So the cycle I've seen when I first got into it, box squats were, amazing. Everyone should do them. And then they fell out of favor and they're like, oh, there should be a stretch reflex, et cetera, et cetera. They don't make sense for raw or equipped. And they went away. And then I think Paul Carter started talking about pause squats. And then a few other guys started talking about pause squats. And pause squats were really, really popular. So it went like west side box squats. No, they're not good. Um, okay. Pause squats are really good. Okay. They kind of fell away from favor. Uh, bands and chains. And then all oh, those don't make any sense. Dynamic effort. Oh no, that doesn't make sense because that's not velocity specific. And, um, in my mind, if these accessory movements are supposed to have such a large impact, they couldn't just come in and out of favor and, and the record's still going in the same progress, everyone progressing the same way. Um, so in my mind, the only accessory movements that I've really, really kept over the years are the ones where I have been able to directly see benefit in myself and my clients. And I, I'm almost loathe to talk about the eccentrics because I don't think anyone should be doing this on their own without an experienced spotter and knowing how and why they're doing it because they're so damn dangerous. But the one thing that I've kept in, the one accessory that is a lift variation is I do heavy eccentrics on bench. So I have a spotter and I will take anywhere from a hundred to say 115% of my one RM and I will lower it under control on my own. And once it touches my chest, they give me a massive bro spot on the way up and I'll do singles, doubles and, and triples, which I find is really helpful on bench because you have to eliminate the, 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 the stretch reflex, you know, and you get a pot, you get a press command and sometimes you don't know how long it's going to be hovering on your chest. Right. So if you can effectively lower, like, let's say I'm a, I, I can bench 150 kg with a pause. Uh, but if I can lower 165 to my chest and, and then get it, get it back up for a couple reps and have the eccentric under control. If I get a two second press command, 150 is cake, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, and there's some hmm. properties of eccentric contractions, which are, are pretty neat. It transfers to concentric strength. Um, it, it, you know, it, it, it allows you to use a heavier load that you're still controlling muscularly. So it's another form of overload. So it makes sense physiologically. Um, there's studies on it and I have done it repeatedly for, for over two years now. And it's the one thing that's given me big payoff. I've done isometrics, which haven't really helped that much. Um, so I basically do the things I know that work. And that makes sense. So it's bodybuilding work, and then a handful of things like that that I've found. Um, I'm th what else is? Yeah, like oh, grip work is another great one that has always paid off really, really well. Like uh, consistently, when I have a deadlifter who is losing their grip, just putting a barbell that starts at one RM and goes up to say 110, 115 percent of their one RM again, right at near lockout, and they just pull out of the rack and they hold it for time, and you build up time. Uh, that tends to it's completely easily fixed grip issues because it's a very direct 
way of training it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen Bryce do so, those. Yeah. yeah. So I think if if I was to 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 list on, I could probably list the lift variation accessories that I do on one hand, and it's like, mm-hmm. you know, super high rack pull which to hold, which is basically grip strength, and then like eccentrics, and maybe close grip bench. Interesting. I could listen to that kind of stuff all day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I think the big thing, too, is that Eric's got a specific reason to include that in his arsenal um, with a, a goal in mind, you know, uh, of th- that, that, that's got a purpose. That, that lift has got a purpose, you know what I mean? And that's the big thing, you know, when it comes to those kind of accessory movements that are, are supporting your lift is are they indeed supporting the lift? You know, uh, I've had a, a, a fair amount of success with, you know, athletes like you, Andrea, who get that mind F when they get underneath, you know, 97% of their, their one RM, mm-hmm. just take some bands, take some bands, throw it on the bar, hook them up to the mm-hmm. top of the cage. Let's do some squatting like that, you know, for a particular block of training, mm-hmm. uh, just to see if we can train that person to, to get used to getting under those heavy loads, you know, and maybe at the end of the block, we'll run their, 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 that, that movement, mm-hmm. um, up to where we're using 115% of their one RM. Mm-hmm. And even, you know, say that they don't, don't squat it, you know, I, that's fine. You know, a lot of times they do squat it because I mean, let's face it, it's bitching when you get 150, 15% of your, your max on the bar, you can actually squat it. You know, that's what people <laughs> usually fall in love with. I love um, when you say bitchin'. bitchin'. I love when you say bitchin'. Oh, I, it makes my day. I know. It's like it, it almost sounds like a, a three-year-old trying to swear, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, as long as the uh-huh. intent is okay, I am using this to, mm-hmm. you know, make this athlete better for this reason. Yeah. I think that's the important thing. Don't just do it because, you know, such and such a a coach is doing it, and there's a fair amount of success. And like Eric said, it's that that new, you know, shiny pair of Jordans yeah. that everybody wants. Um, yeah, and that's, so Brad has the same mindset I do. It's it, it makes sense. There's a logical purpose, and it's it's not just because other people are doing it. And I, I think some people will say, well, what about variation? And I go, I, I agree that we, we have data to support. There should be some variation in training. But I think, I don't, I, I don't ever think that there needs to be, like, you don't need to have variation in the movement you're trying to get better at, you know, like, it's not like swimmers don't go right. I got to get on a bike to become a better swimmer, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. You might do periods of less or more main lift, but you're always keeping them in there and you have to practice the main movement to get good at it. Yeah. So to me, the variation should come in volume, load, frequency, intensity, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. So variation in rep ranges, you know, variation in stress levels. Um, yeah. and I, so I agree on that. I just, I just reject the idea that you have to you, you're going to get stale on that movement pattern. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. You get, that's not the way motor learning works. You don't, you know, you, you got to stop riding cause you're going to get, it's, you're just going to start drawing right. in circles cause it's just too much. Yeah. yeah. It makes no sense. I mean, however though, I, I will say that I do get burned out on riding sometimes and I have to take a break. So that's the variation and the equivalent of volume and, and intensity, yeah. you know? So yeah, but I don't, I don't, you know, start doing graffiti art to get better at writing or something <laughs> like that. You know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> And we, it was, now that I'm, um, it's all coming back, this was our last, or two, like, 3DMJ meetings ago, we were talking about this, um, and just for the audience to know, the thing that helped me the most, which I would have never thought, was, um, the whole time I was doing bodybuilding, powerlifting, it was obviously in a gym that had safety bars, um, I have a medium-ish, like, not a low bar, not a high bar, typically, and if, uh, and because Shemedium. I am a schmedium, it's not really high or low, <laughs> uh, especially when I was doing powerlifting. It's a little higher now that I'm trying to learn Olympic lifts. But um, whenever I would um, fail a lift because I am mobile, I just crumble into a little ball and it would end up on the rack behind me, right? Um, and it wasn't until I started training at a CrossFit gym without um, sidebars, without safety, and I had to get a spot. Um and Olympic lifters, I guess, spot the bar as opposed to all my powerlifting friends that spot me here. And so whenever, um, and so as you're listening, how would I describe powerlifting spot? Like uh, your spotter has their hands behind under bear hug, behind bear yeah. hug, the almost inappropriate boobs, but like not really if they're not jackasses kind of thing. Um, which is why Brandon usually spotted me, but the the, behind, <laughs> the, the almost boob grab, but it's okay because you're just saving my life kind of thing. 
Um, That's why I spot Barb on all of her sets. There you Even go. Even the at the bar. <laughs> and um, when I would be, quote unquote, saved in those AMRAPs, uh, when I was just doing being spotted like that, I could feel someone helping me. And then when someone, when I've changed now to where my spotter holds the bar, typically, they'll tell me, hey, I've been helping you for the past three, and I'm over here thinking I got it. So um, it was like that ability to feel like I don't have it, but then somehow in my brain it was happening, and I was like, oh. So it was totally, um, yeah, mental. Because I was the kid in gymnastics that I was like, I'm going to keep doing this in the pit till I figure it out instead of my coach spotting mm -hmm. me. And I'm, I think I'm just the same way with, like, I'd be like, I don't want to spot her, I don't want to spot her, I want to spot I can do it, I can do it. And now that I realized I could do it, then it was like, now I'm getting used to am wrapping better, to feeling it better, uh, being more confident under the bar. But it just took someone, me, I guess, super, what's the word, super comp, not super compensating, what's the word, above my max, super max. Super maximal, yeah. Yeah, that's the no, word. I, I, <laughs> I, yeah, there, there, there are definitely sometimes mm -hmm. mental stuff can get in the way. I, I know for me, um, I kind of just retooled my sumo deadlift to being more patient on the floor and not trying to jerk and go because it keeps my position better much more often. And it's hard mentally to not shut it down mm -hmm. because it feels like it's not going to go anywhere. And then it's not until it breaks the floor that it starts to get easier as you go up. Mm -hmm. um, but... Yeah, like if for someone who's doing that for the first time, it's so often you'll see them and it feels like you're spending so much more time than you actually are. Like you'll see someone pull on the bar and sumo for a second and then just stop and go, no, it's not going to go. And um, then if you can get them to go back to it, coach them and go, right, keep the hips in position. Don't try to forklift it because you're nervous and just keep pulling and be patient and then just keep pulling harder. Then it comes off the floor and it goes. Mm -hmm. And it's, you don't, you don't know that until you know that, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah. You can't explain yeah, so that. You have to kind of develop that faith almost. Exactly. And it, it, that's just time spent doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you guys uh, got a chance to watch my, my most recent vlog where I went over the US APL meet that my, my student that I was mentioning at the very beginning of this podcast did. I, exact same weight. You know, I think it was 419 pounds. He got up there on his second attempt, and you would have thought that weight was bolted to the floor. It didn't budge. Mm -hmm. It did not budge. He didn't even come close to even getting that to roll you know what i mean uh but you know kind of coached him through it kind of coached him through the things that eric was talking about you know you got to kind of think you know what this is going to be hard we got to push with the legs push with the legs it was the very next attempt at the same weight not 10 minutes later it flew up yeah but i think he had to fail i think he had to fail that first time know what it felt like have the tools to know how to, to overcome it. And then now he could get it. You know, I think that's kind of one of those things is you got to feel it. You got to know what that feels like. Yeah. I love it. I love this shit because everyone just thinks you're just going to get stronger. You're just going to get stronger. And it's like, there's a skill, there's a skill to mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. Um, since I know that we're running out of time here in like 20 ish minutes, right, Brad? Um, there's two things I wanted to hit on, right? We got 20. Yeah, yeah we're good. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the differences in when you do have a, since we already established, okay, there's not really very many dual athletes, but if there was someone doing both and their immediate, their more immediate goal is powerlifting or their more immediate goal is the bodybuilding stage, the differences in programming, which I'm assuming would be accessories, arms, calves for most people. Uh, but can y'all go specifically into the things beyond that or if that is where mm -hmm. we just did? Eric, you should go first on that one. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I have had some pure dual, even though they're more rare. Um, and a lot of it is just, um, so the squat bench deadlift, they're great movements. And if you're a, you know, a power lifter who is trying to get bigger, which powerlifters are, cause it does contribute something to strength. Um, you would think, okay, I get a lot of volume from those movements, but there, there are, there are higher cost movements to get a lot of volume from the big three. It, it does cause more joint strain and more mental stress. It just takes a long time. Like if you try to do, you know, a full body hypertrophy session that includes all three lifts, you're going to be friggin' wrecked and it's going to take all day, you know? Um, so the, um, sometimes I find for the time and energy cost, it makes more sense for a, a powerlifter who's going to be doing a, a bodybuilding off season, let's say, even if it's not, you know, uh, prep, uh, to reduce the volume on the big three, keep them in to maintain that movement pattern. 
and then pump up the volume on uh, on the accessory movements. You know, bring in more more rows, more pull downs, more curls, push downs, triceps, uh, overhead press, calves, and then isolation movements of the legs, like leg extension, leg curl. Mm-hmm. Um, then when they are closer to a powerlifting season, that's when you get very minimalist with your accessory work and you do more volume with the big three. So you go, right, uh, what can I get away with so the person doesn't lose muscle? Okay, I'm going to have them curl, do bicep curls once a week, you know, do tricep pushdowns once or twice a week, row maybe once a week and do pull downs twice and do calf raises and maybe get a hamstring curl in there, but nothing else and, mm-hmm. and a, a lower number of sets. And then it gives them more time to fit into their schedule doing you know, when you might have to do like six by four on, on, on squats or something like that to get the requisite, uh, training volume in. So it, it is, uh, it becomes logistical almost. And then just going, right, we're going to, since we're, the deadlift may not be the most efficient way to train my hamstrings, but, um, because I'm doing so much of it, I'm going to have to, you know, we're, we're going we're to drop down other, other hamstring related accessory work. Mm-hmm. Same with you, Brad. Yeah, yeah. It, it, if if I understood Eric correctly on a lot of that, um, kind of the same thing. You know, you just you, you have to kind of think to yourself, well, maybe maybe right now the deadlift is not the best exercise to have um, because we're fragile. You know, but we're going to need to figure out something to, to to make up for that. You know, whether it's uh, hamstring curls, weighted, you know, um, hyperextensions, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, that's the big thing is where is, where is your emphasis? You know, we're going to have to kind of shift more towards lighter weight, uh, more volume stuff, uh, as you go more towards your, your bodybuilding side of the pendulum. And then of course, just like Eric said, when you go toward your power lifting, we're going to be squat benching and dead. We don't need to be doing, you know, umpteen sets of, of curls and shrugs and things like that. We better start moving things over toward this side of the pendulum. How, um, I guess, how effective have you seen that? Like when you say, okay, someone just finished their last powerlifting meet and we want to get on a stage in, say, eight months. Now we're going to put all this fluff work back in. Do you really see measurable size differences? Or have you guys really Eric. seen, like, big big changes in, like, a, in a trained individual with just that much amount of time? Mm-hmm. I know Eric has. Yeah. Eric, talk about your... your three times a week with your curls and you started your calf raises too. Yeah. 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 No. So yeah, I mean, and I, I've seen this with in athletes as well. So yeah, it's more that I see overall development doesn't change a, like specific development changes. Right? right. So, uh, I find that if I bench a lot, my arms stay big, my chest stays big, my delts stay big, like, and, and they'll even grow. But a lot of my arm size is due to my triceps. And I, 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 if I keep a lot of rowing and, pull, and doing pull downs in, they stay there as well. But I do notice, maybe it's just the edema, that when I start curling more often, my arms are even a little bit more bigger. Um, my calves completely disappeared from, from not having trained them regularly. Um, they were hanging around when I was doing Olympic lifting because there's always that triple extension. Um, but, for, but that's not in powerlifting. So um, some things that I've noticed from doing accessory work, um, my quads have improved. Um, and I, I see this in especially um, very kind of like low bar posterior chain dominant squatters is that if they're just doing a bunch of low bar squats, if you throw front squats back in and leg extensions, um, you'll see a, a noticeable difference in, in, in quad development. Um, less so in more upright, like natural squatters tend to get very good overall leg development from squats. You know, good example, like Mike Zerdos has fantastic quads and he just does low bar squats, but he's built to squat kind of thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, and then um, back work, I think deadlifts are great, but there's just not a whole lot of, like, scapular retraction and, and shoulder extension from the deadlift. So I, I, I think they, uh, and there's a few people who have written about this before, that you need to do both back building and deadlifting, you know. Um, so I think what I, what I have seen in athletes and what makes sense logically and what I've seen in myself is improvements in uh, back development. Uh, bicep development, calf development, and sometimes quad development, depending on how they squat. Um, but overall development, I w- it's not like all of a sudden, because you're doing you know dumbbell chest press, you you get better pec development. I, like the target muscle groups that are very effectively trained by the big three, 
don't change much, you know, at all um, from from switching to big three. Train most everything. Yeah. Um, and if you're really well built for powerlifting, you're kind of like a little short limbed manlet who stays very upright in a squat, no matter how low the bar goes. Um, you may have a very good physique just from the big three, which which you'll see in in uh, in, in the right built people. Um, yeah. And and then you know you can tailor it a little bit differently. Word, I think um, I asked that because I have a lot of uh, people who did their funsies bodybuilding training in the gym, and they're like, okay, I want to start doing this power. I want to get stronger in the big three. You take away some of their accessory work, and you know they're not curling three days a week now, and they think it's all going to go. Um, mm. And like you said, it's not like you're completely rebuilding a bicep from nothing when you introduce it into your program. It's just waking back up, like I said, the edema, the fullness, the, you know, and I think um, people, it's it's funny how how long it takes to build, how quick they think it'll go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it is a big fear factor there. It's, 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 yeah. it's, it's uh, they, they normally, if you, if you logic with them a little bit, they, they mm-hmm. come around. And then it's just a matter of they won't really fully buy in to, to, to that coaching advice, even if you logic with them until they see it, you know. Yeah. Um, and I typically have a fair bit of like pull downs and like vertical rowing that I and chest supported rowing that I do with my, my power lifters. So when a bodybuilder goes from doing that plus curls to no curls, they expect to lose arm size and they often don't. Yeah. And uh, sometimes there's no no impact at all. And we realized just how superfluous the curls were because you do actually bend your elbow and you do a row and a pull down, believe it or not. Yeah. You know, kind um, of thing. I've, so, um, yeah. Yeah. A lot of times they have to go through the process to realize they're not going to lose all their gains. I've been lucky to have that um, as of late with my lower body development. I've never had a weak lower body by any means, but I currently have not done any leg accessory work in eight months or something in my glutes, hams, quads have gone up like crazy, but I increase my squat frequency. Shit, I've squat in some way, I think, for at least four days a week. Yeah, so you do the Olympic variations, squats. Deadlifts. Deadlifts. And then all the shit like wall balls and running. I run now. Mm. Uh, I bike. And you do plyometric type stuff too mm-hmm. as well, right? Yep, and jumps, weighted yeah, stuff. Yeah. So it's like I, I, I squat Single leg squats as well, right? Way every day, yeah, pistol squats. Yeah, so I mean... So the, I, the volume. It, at, I'd be hard pressed to see how you couldn't have good leg development from all that. Well, that's you know? what I'm saying, though, and like it's it's been a lot a lot easier of a sell, is what I'm saying. When I have someone, mm-hmm. it's like I'm not curling. I'm like, well, I haven't leg curled in forever, and like, look at my legs six months ago. Like, yeah, just meh. Uh, For sure. Last thing. Well, it's not maybe not the last, unless you had something else. But I wanted to touch on um, core development and the the. You have a really good video on it, and I wrote a blog post about the video, Eric, um, saying like yeah. just about core strength and how it has a function for everybody. And then beyond that, if you do want to step on stage, the ways that um, you know bodybuilders are scared of not having abs in their program, but that's not something that we all immediately put in their program all the time, and they freak out and they're like, "Shouldn't I have abs in this?" Yeah. Um, you mind yeah. elaborating yeah. on that? Your ears freak out about that too. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and you know, that's one thing that, that, you know, people always talk about buzzwords and, and core has been a buzzword that's been in this business now for shoot what a decade, you know, yeah. and it's so, it, it's so misused, you mm-hmm. know, it, it, you, you think about just the, the, the word core, you know, it's kind of like, how can my abs be my core? You know, that's like saying the apple peel is the core of the apple. You know, yeah. so it's, it's such a misused word and it's almost become kind of a, a pet peeve of mine. Let's do some core work and we'll go do 150 leg raises, you know. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the first thing I want to differentiate is, is that just what that is. What is the core? You know, when I think of the core, I think of the core of the apple. We've got the psoas muscles. We've got all those internal pelvic muscles, you know. Yeah. That's the core of, of what is supporting our big main movements, our squat our deadlift, you know, all, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I just want to make sure that I differentiate between those things because your squat is working and building your core, you know, is it necessarily, you know, building your abs? Well, I think that's a very, very subjective thing. And we could argue, uh, you know, until the, the cows come home when it comes to that. 
But I mean, let's just face it. You know, this is kind of the way that I look at abs. They're kind of a silly muscle. You know what I mean? <laughs> they, they really silly muscle. Do they do. They don't do much except promote bad posture. You know, you think about the bicep, it contracts, it brings your, you know, it foreshortens, it brings your arm up. You think about the abs, they contract, brings your, 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 your ribs and your pubic bone together. Ugh, bad posture, you know. So really, in my mind, functionally, they don't do much except kind of hold our guts in, you know. So how much can we, can we I mean, how much do we need to train them? And, and therefore, how much do they really take away from our recovery? You know, I mean, I've seen people train abs every single day and they always look the same. And it doesn't take away from their squat, their bench, and their deadlift. I say that person, you know what? If that makes you feel good, go ahead. We don't really even need to worry about that. If it makes you happy, you know, go for it, you know. Uh, but at the same time, sometimes I don't think we necessarily have to focus, you know, on that exercise. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So th those are my unprofessional opinions. <laughs> no. <of all. laughs> no, they matter. And it's – it's um. I think too, it's like when they, they say, I don't have any core work. It's like every squat is core work, <laughs> every, you know, every deadlift and, and core is, it's not necessarily the power that asked me. It's the, the bodybuilders who we come in. This is our first resistance training program to get, it's probably their first, um, semi sound program that they're actually mm. adhering to. And, um, they come from doing 30 minutes of abs three days a week into now we're actually training in this manner with calculated volume and this and that, and they're worried they're going to lose their abs. Um, most of them don't have abs to start with. And when we even say abs, obviously, I think we should clarify, we all know that everybody has abdominal muscles. But um, most of the time, again, when it's someone who's the first time coming at me, I want to be a physique athlete, it's like, well, you're just not lean enough like they're there. Um, anyways, go ahead. Keep going, Eric. You were going to say something. Yeah, I, I, it, normally there's one or two conversations that happens. If, if it's a, a strength-focused person, um, then they go, right, I, I need a strong core to support my lefts. And I go, yes, that's true. So then they go, well, why am I not doing heavy-weighted crunches? And I, I kind of go, so when you have a bar on your back and you're bent forward, that is trying to push you into the position you're trying to get into with a crunch. That's, so the crunch is not making you better at resisting that, right? That's that's flexion, not anti-flexion. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they're like, oh, oh, and that makes sense. It's it's, it's an easy sell, and I go, but I agree. Your ability to, to push your your abs out against your uh, your your belt to flare and and brace your core that's going to help you stay upright. Uh, and they go, okay, so how do I train that? And I go, squats, <laughs> benches, and deadlifts. Um, yeah. Right. But um, but that, that said, it doesn't mean if that is something that they really, really struggle with, you can do a heavy weighted back extension. That makes a little more sense to me. You, you can do um, like pal off press variations. You can do things that are directly targeting anti flexion, anti rotation, anti extension, anti all that stuff. Right. Um, but I think the problem is, is that the only thing that we understand in our brains to be core work is basically crunches and Pilates, you know, uh, and I don't think either one of those is very useful for a power lifter. So that that conversation happens for the for the bodybuilder um it's a little more straightforward it's like yeah you're, you're probably right you're not getting a whole lot of great direct ab training from uh you know some lifts but because you don't have anything any bones in the front of your body that's just it's all the abdominal wall like people don't understand how much uh activation and and and, and and uh, co-contraction you get in your abs almost every single free weight lift. So how much additional ab training do you need? I think probably very not very much at all. If you're a bodybuilder and you have weak abs, sure, we'll throw in some, some weighted stuff. But then, then the, the misconception that the bodybuilders have is often they think, like you said, they train. You didn't even give me a set and rep scheme. You, you said, Andrea, you said 30 minutes, which is a very common thing. They mm -hmm. train it like – they're, they're going to enter some, some abdominal marathon, right? Where it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, who can do, or, or like, like Brad said, 150 leg raises. So mm -hmm. if we want to do ab training to hypertrophy the muscle, you train it intelligently, you know, let, let's get a, a six to eight, you know, decline weighted crunches day. And then let's get a 12 to 15, you know, like weighted reverse crunch or whatever we want to not weighted mm -hmm. reverse crunch, but reverse crunch or something, yeah. you know, let's, let's train it in, in a effective manner. So that is normally the conversation that happens. And then, like Brad, I can't say that I've ever seen adding 
direct abdominal work to an already sound training program. That's a big caveat. Like if someone's doing all machine work and they add an ab work, they might get a, you know, they might see a benefit. But when you're training in the way that we train people and you add in weighted crunches, I have yet to see any visible change. Mm. Um, and that's, we're talking a couple hundred people, you know, that, so I, I just, I just, so it's, it's, I never, whenever, basically, whenever a bodybuilder says, I want to do some ab work, I go, sure. Me you know, too. I'm like, yeah, if you there. want to. Yeah, just, yeah. just leave me alone. Yeah. Quit asking me that question, kid. Here, do, do some Because <laughs> you know? it's general, generally not going to hurt anyone. I mean, no. if you say, exactly. but I limit. Exactly. What I do is I limit. I'm like, feel free twice a week, no more than 50 reps. Okay. Like, I, don't, I don't care yeah. what you do. That's, I don't care. It's exactly <laughs> yeah. what I do. I'll say, okay, you know what? Yeah. I want you to do between 10 and 40 repetitions, you know? Yeah. And, and I don't know about you guys, but I've, I've, Oftentimes, you know, through accident, stalk people, you know, because we all stalk our, our clients on Instagram. I insta um, I stalk a lot. I people do. on Instagram going, when did they start doing 150 crunches with their feet against the wall, you know? And I didn't even know it happened, but yet their, their training progression is still on par, yeah. you know? It's still going just like we planned it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's kind of why I'm not doing anything. <laughs> exactly. If, if it makes you feel good, it's not going to take away from the rest of your program. You know, feel yeah. free. If it doesn't to... develop any fatigue, it's probably also not developing fitness. So <laughs> exactly. enjoy, yeah. enjoy your dance. You know. Yeah. 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 So, but don't don't stress over it either. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I and I just think too. Um, it goes to the back back to the same age old problem of unless you have been on a bodybuilding stage or figure, and I would argue not even physique or bikini, unless you've been contest lean on bodybuilding or a high level of figure athlete, um, you probably don't know how lean you need to get to see the abs that are there. Yeah. Like there are plenty of bikini girls even that look great in a bathing suit, but are upset they can't get abs, uh, mm -hmm. but they're just not as lean as they think they are, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And and like think about the abdominal muscle. Really, I mean, it's it's a pretty thin muscle. You know exactly how much hypertrophy can you get out of that? I think that's very questionable, and obviously very individual. Yeah, I, I have I, my abdominal development is always my best body part. Yeah, I and have. we're opposite. Mm -hmm. I've had like yeah. veins shredded da, 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 and like two abs on stage, and I'm like, God. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can it, I can it, have it, like back fat rolls over my belt and still have a four pack. You know, yeah, you and Ogie, yeah. damn it, because they're yeah. so prominent. Yeah, but I don't, I don't directly train my abs. And also, ever. and yeah. the thing is, I have, not to toot my heart, I've been because of my gymnastics, very strong abdominals, like compared to the average. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you guys have seen me in like I'm toe raising and whatever, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. I can do all that stuff, but my abs just suck. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I'm like defeated by it. Um, I could try to fight it for a long time, but after many years of, I mean, when I was a little kid in gymnastics, it was sets of a hundred v ups, like literally. 100 in a row holding a hollow um and there i had friends who you could see the little abs through leotards and i just wasn't one of them like yeah that's it yeah. but i had a little bubble like, booty like it's just that was my right. strength um anyways i wanted to get that out there because it, it is a misconception on both ends the powerlifting and the bodybuilding it, for, yeah. for sure yeah yeah because i mean i'm like eric i can be 185 pounds and i look like a fat man with traps and a four pack you know <laughs> And, and I'm not kidding. I, I literally do. I hate the way I look. And then, you know, at the same time, like, look at you. You've got str tremendously strong abs. You've had a ton of core work over the year with all of your gymnastics and everything. Yet, you know, we, we've had you shredded and, and barely been able to, to see your abs. You know, it's yeah. such a, a, twist a, certain it's such a way. silly muscle. Yeah. Such a silly muscle. You know, silly and then muscle. you see... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I, I, highly overrated, too, in my opinion. <laughs> Uh, alrighty, friends, we're about up at time. Is there anything um, important that y'all think I that we left out? Not that we're not going to talk every week for like years to come, but uh, mainly just debate. you know, go hard, go home, and uh, squat, bench, deadlift, and don't do anything else, and train every day. That's exactly what we said this last hour and a half. Yeah, that sums it up yep. quite nicely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Brad, anything? Um, yeah, I mean, not, I think the big thing that I would just like to get out there is that, um, you know, and not to, not to, to disagree with Eric, because I think there is a certain amount of sarcasm, but you know, you don't necessarily have to train yourself into the floor to get the response that you're after. 
You know, it was a little more than a certain amount of sarcasm. That was all sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in a... In You're so way. darn good at it, too, brother. You know that? Yeah. Thank you. But, yeah, I mean, I have gotten more strength gains. And really, to be honest with you, I think more physique development, training smarter and not harder over the last two years. And, you know, I it, I really I, I think it's a big part of that is just because I did not know how coachable I was. I didn't know that Eric could say, you know what, it's OK to and he didn't tell me this, obviously. But, you know, in my program, it's OK the squat, suboptimal for five singles, you know, do it in context of this and this and this. Mm-hmm. I don't have to kill myself every single day in the gym. In fact, really, that's counterproductive, you know, and I've, I've learned that the hard way. Um, treat your training like an athlete does. You know, don't go out there and go 60 minutes on the football field as hard as you can getting rocked every single day of practice, you know, mm-hmm. make it smart and then, you know, pick your shots and, 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 and make your training count, you know, for the big day yeah i think um i guess a closing thing that i'd want to leave it with is they depending on i guess everything's context based as we know but depending on who you are some people i think need to realize how different these sports can be and at the same time like if you are so married to one or the other what you're missing from the other if that makes sense so that was all i kind of wanted to illustrate throughout this conversation but if that you is it, well. oh well, thanks. You guys did well. I don't know. I don't know shit about anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Love you guys, and I'll talk to y'all next week. See ya. All right. Adios, amigos. Thanks, you guys.